Funding for Shaper Illus is provided by Skillshare, the sponsor of today's video. Hey gang, this is part two of a six-part BoJack Horseman retrospective I'm doing with William, aka Space Tree Studios. We did part one a few months back, so check that out if you haven't already. We wrote and recorded part two at the same time as part one, since they were originally intended to be part of the same video, and the reason this part took so long to come out was because William insisted on being the sole editor for this entire retrospective. And I agreed. That wasn't either of our best ideas, so I brought in my boy Goop videos to speed the process along and he finished editing more than half the video in like two days. Be sure to thank him because he's the reason the video is out right now. But also thank me because I hired him. But also thank William because he conceived this idea of this retrospective in the first place. Anyway, with all that said, let's talk season two. Shia Kazing! <laughs> Season 2 is an exceptional leap in quality in almost every way. The characters are more compelling, the jokes are more hilarious, the storylines are more cohesive. Everything is stepped up to the next level, and while the telescope and downer ending were great indications of things to come, this season is, in my opinion, where the show as we know it today really gets going. The first episode offers a pretty heartbreaking perspective of Bojack's relationship with his mother. We didn't mention it, but the first season offered brief flashbacks to Bojack's messed up childhood and his awful parents. Clearly they played a role in shaping him into the broken person he ended up becoming, but with this episode we get a more thorough look as to why that is. Bojack can't perform a sad line in his movie properly no matter how hard he tries to act, and his mother calling him to tell him that he was born broken is what gets him sad enough to deliver the line properly. After spending the whole episode adapting to a new, more positive outlook on life, one conversation with his emotionally abusive mother is an enough to send him spiraling back down to where he was at before. It's heartbreakingly realistic. There's even a great subtle callback to the very first episode that shows how Bojack has internalized his mother's lack of support for his show. Well, it wasn't Ibsen. That's not Ibsen, sure. Bojack's relationship with his parents is an essential component of the show, and it being intertwined with Secretary is no coincidence. It's actually kind of weird how the two literally collide sometimes. At the end of season one, we see the interview Secretary did with Dick Cavett, where Secretary reads a letter Bojack himself sent. His advice to Bojack was, Bojack, when you get sad, you run straight ahead and, and you keep running forward no matter what. Don't you stop running and don't you ever look behind you. There's nothing for you behind you. All that exists is what's ahead. However, in season two, when we are reintroduced to Bojack, we see the same moment from his kid self's point of view. Bojack's parents were arguing incredibly loudly, and we see Bojack push his chair up closer to the TV. Now, there are two interpretations of this moment. The first being what most fans saw. We hear Bojack's parents arguing over the interview, so it's assumed that Bojack never got to hear what his hearer said to him during that interview. This is what most, me included at first, thought was going on. However, in the season two DVD and Blu-ray commentary, more of this video is by the Blu-ray, Raphael Bogwalks were clarifies that what he intended was that by having Bojack get closer and closer to the TV, he was listening so intently that he only heard that and internalized the advice so much it became his entire life's mantra. Never stop running, don't look back, even if you hurt someone, there's nothing there for you. <gasps> yeah, that's some heavy stuff. Let's move on to Disneyland! One of the best examples of how the show can switch gears so effectively into delightful, absurdist comedy. This episode sees Todd accidentally exploit a legal loophole by calling his new theme park Disneyland, because apparently Walt Disney accidentally misspelled Disneyland on his copyright. Hilarious! Hey guys, what's up? It's The Purge, and today on Defunct Land, we're taking a look at the time Walt Disney misspelled his own damn name. Seeing Todd take center stage on a wacky adventure, and seeing his relationship with the equally wacky Mr. Peanut Butter grow is both funny and wholesome. Also, Halloween in January is the best idea for a store ever. Are you kidding? How has this not been funded yet? This episode also introduces Wanda, Bojack's new girlfriend for the rest of the season. I particularly love her addition because she serves as an optimistic foil to Bojack's pessimism. Bojack gets a curly fry mixed in with his regular fries and gets upset about it, but Wanda sees it as a nice little bonus. That's a really nice way of showing the contrast between their perspectives, and the storyline about the Soviet sleeper agent who was also in a coma is fun too. Uh, oh yeah, Wanda was in a coma for 30 years as well, but th th that's not really important, that's just another wacky out of context thing I'll mention to confuse people who haven't seen the show. Which by the way, if you haven't seen the show, what are you doing watching this video? Just watch the show! <laughs> 
In a way, Wanda kind of acts as a counter to Herb. Where Herb would fuel Bojack's negativity, Wanda would instead steer those same situations into something positive. Where Wanda sees a nice little bonus in a curly fry or an onion ring, Herb would just go, Who puts an onion ring in my french fries? They're two separate vats. How hard is it to keep them apart? They're not even close in the name. One's a fry and one's a ring. They're made of two different things, BJ. Speaking of Herbert, episode three is a little horsing around family reunion at Herb's funeral, where Bojack tries to ascribe some sort of meaning to Herb's death, only to find out that death doesn't really have meaning. I mean, this episode tells us that Herb actually managed to beat cancer, but then on the drive home, he crashed into a peanut truck and died from his peanut allergy. It's treated as a joke because... Well, it is one. Nothing changes plot-wise, Herb is still dead around the time we expected him to die, even if the way he died was different from what we expected. And yet, the fact that he died from a freak accident like this instead of cancer really highlights how death is kinda meaningless and bullshit sometimes. And episode 4 is one of my favorites of the season, even if it does kinda waste time with more Vincent adult mansion against why is he still on the show? Well, like, it's decently funny stuff, I don't dislike him, but like, c come on. Anyway, the episode is separated into three chunks, all centered around three different couples. Princess Carolyn and Pedophilia, Bojack and Wanda, and lastly, Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter. The fact that the episode saved them for last really surprised me on my first viewing. Like, what did these two have to offer that could be more dramatic or impactful than Bojack and Wanda- Listen to me, he is dead, goddammit! Uh... In just one third of an episode, we get to see way more depth to Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter's relationship than we've ever thought possible. This is where we're introduced to the ballroom. This moment seems like just a nice little jokey joke at first, but it's one of the first big instances, and far from the last, of Mr. Peanut Butter not listening in more ways than one. Mr. Peanut Butter recalls Diane mentioning before how ever since she was a child, she wanted a ballroom. Mr. Peanut Butter, being a dog, interprets this as a giant ball pit from Charles Pasquale into Entertainment's Cheese Pizza Place. This is later called back to in Season 4 when not only did he make it the wrong kind of ballroom, but it wasn't even supposed to be a ballroom at all. It was a bell room. But we'll get to that little tidbit next time. Oh, and there's an episode about chickens for some reason. It serves no purpose to the plot other than the writers having to address the animals eating animals thing. It's funny, but like... What? Yeah, we eat animals here. Just shut up and don't think about it. Waiter cow serves a steak, bitch! Yeah, it's not very important, but it's a pretty solid world-building explanation for animals eating animals. The auto-erotic asphyxiation episode was lighthearted and enjoyable too, even if it did end with the unfortunate demise of Corduroy Jackson Jackson. Literally at the very end of the episode, we see him dead, and then the cheerful credits roll. This is one of the show's hallmarks, ending an episode on a massive reveal or dramatic sting or heart-wrenching moment or shocking moment or some other shit, and then immediately cutting to the credits. It's an intentional helping of mood whiplash and it works wonders, especially in the first three seasons when the main credits theme is used most often. They started mixing things up later in the show's run, but we'll get to that later, obviously. Episode 7, Hank After Dark, was the show's first attempt at covering a serious, real-world issue. In this case, sexual misconduct, and they covered it perfectly. It's heavy and intense, but not overly dark, and it's neat that the show called this sort of thing out before the Me Too movement happened, showing that the writers considered this a problem worth talking about before the rest of the entertainment industry caught up to them. Anyway, moving on to one of the best episodes in the entire entire series. Okay, Bojack, for the million dollar question, did you fuck my wife? No. Attention Hollywood, I've come to make an announcement. Bojack Horseman is a bitch ass motherfucker who kissed my wife. He took out his horse face lips and kissed my fucking wife. He said his career was this big. And I said, that's prophetic. Yeah, let's find out is a god tier episode. It mixes zaniness and heavy drama extremely effectively. It's really well set up by the previous episodes, as Princess Carolyn finds reclusive author J.D. Salinger, who wrote Catcher in the Rye and... other books. She convinces him to start a new project. Holly Woo stars and celebrities, what do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. And she gets Mr. Peanut Butter to host, with Bojack being the very first guest. So we've got the typical zany shenanigans where Bojack gets frustrated over the increasingly nonsensical rules of the game, Todd competes with another intern for J.D. Salinger's prized pen, and Daniel Radcliffe shows up to grab money out of the air. It's funny looking back because at this point he was still known for Harry Potter, and here he is on a wacky game show, but then you look at 
at his career since, and this is actually tame for him. It's already set to become a highlight of the season. And then this happens. How come your wife flew all the way to war-torn Cordovia just to get away from you? She went to help people. Or maybe she went to help herself get away from her awful marriage. Oh, was that too far? All of a sudden, things get real. Mr. Peanut Butter snaps, dropping his nice facade and getting angry at Bojack for kissing his wife and treating him like a joke. It turns out Mr. Peanut Butter isn't as stupid as we think. Well, he's stupid, just not in that way. He knows Bojack doesn't like him, and he's heartbroken about this. All he wants to do is be friends, but Bojack isn't happy enough with himself to treat Mr. Peanut Butter with any sort of respect. It's a really sad situation, but at least they're able to kiss and make up for the time being. No, I'm not joking, they literally kiss. Now this is cinema. Yes! But nothing compares to the insane ending, where Bojack allows a pile of money for charity to get thrown into the fire. All because he wants to spite Daniel Radcliffe for not remembering his name. It's one of Bojack's most callous and shocking actions, but it's a phenomenal ending. Very in line with his character. <laughs> he just lost all your money! You miss 100% of the shots you don't take and also about 90% of the ones you do because now we have to talk about episode 9, The Shot. In this episode, Bojack notices how Lenny is meddling in the production to his and Kelsey's dismay. When Lenny cuts an important scene, Bojack convinces Kelsey to come with them to break into the Richard Nixon Museum, roll with it, to illegally get that shot anyway. It's a great moment that not only shows off more Bojack's acting chops and how much he truly cares about this project, but also a connection between him and Kelsey it's great, too bad it gets Kelsey fired. This ending really stings because it once again subverts our expectations in an intentionally negative manner. You'd expect a story like this to end with Lenny being so impressed with the shot and the tenacity Bojack and Kelsey displayed by getting it that he puts it in the movie and commends them for it. But no, f*** that. Kelsey is fired and Bojack ruins someone else's life while getting no repercussions for himself. It's what he does. It's disappointing, but at least we got to see more of bloodthirsty character actress Margot Martindale in an overall fun, heisty episode. I'm so glad Alan didn't die. I honestly never expected to get so wrapped up in the safety of a random repairman I don't know at all. We also get more development from Princess Carolyn here. She goes along with the rest of the crew to the heist, but kind of spaces out and we get to see more of her inner desires. There's small surface level stuff here like Vanessa being her maid and getting to live the good life, but as it goes on it becomes more apparent that she just can't live like that. She needs to keep pushing forward. She doesn't want the simple life. This is a parallel of sorts to Bojack. Both are always running, just in two different directions. Episode 10 sees Bojack's relationship with his dream movie deteriorate since he doesn't like the new director, and his relationship with Wanda, which has been spiraling downward ever since she found out Bojack kissed Diane, finally falls apart in this episode. It's really sad that Wanda never appeared again after this, but in a way, it's fairly realistic that Bojack never encountered his ex again. Still, I wish we could have gotten something more out of Wanda outside of a brief newspaper headline in the finale. But Bojack, dissatisfied with everything that's going on in his life, decides to seek out the last person in his life that truly made him happy. But before we get into that, we have some Diane and Todd stuff to discuss. Alright, so the improv stuff. It's good, but more of a chance for Bojack to prove himself to Todd in the final episode. Not really a way for Todd to develop on his own. It feels weird that out of all Todd plot lines, this is the one that gets stretched over two episodes. Nothing about it seems that special or interesting outside of Bojack's intervention in the finale, which could have happened with Todd doing anything. But it's a decent enough thing for Todd to be doing, I guess. Meanwhile, we have Diane's plot line. As we know, she leaves LA to go to War Torn Cordovia trademark to write about Sebastian St. Clair's work. However, the longer she she stays, the more she notices how Sebastian St. Clair is clearly doing all this for the wrong reasons. Disenfranchised after a child she grew attached to dies in a bombing, she secretly heads back to LA. Unable to face Mr. Peanut Butter at the time about what happened, she ends up bumming at Bojack's house for a couple days. <laughs> Weeks. <laughs> what the hell, Diane? Throughout the time Diane and Bojack spend hanging out, here we begin to notice something about their friendship in that they enable each other in the worst ways. While they try to help, they're oftentimes bringing out the most toxic traits in each other. We'd see this again in season four, but it's really shown for the first time in full here. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back for Wanda, and that's when she leaves, as we mentioned earlier. When Bojack leaves for his big 11th episode adventure, Diane stays behind and wallows in the same kind of sadness that Bojack has for basically all his life. Diane and Bojack are more alike than either of them want to admit to themselves or each other. Anyway, though, 
though, it's time for the dreaded episode 11. The one where everything goes wrong. Except not really, because it's super pleasant. Bojack seeks out his old friend Charlotte in New Mexico, pretends he's here for a boat show, and stays with her family for two months, completely blowing off his contractual obligations to the movie he's in. It's nice to get a break from the cynical tar pit that is LA, and it's great to see Bojack actually happy. But we know that it ultimately can't last. We know that this show never offers any sort of easy outs or happy endings, and everything starts to become clear as Bojack starts befriending Charlotte's teenage daughter, Penny. It's so easy to see where this is headed, but we keep lying to ourselves, saying maybe he won't do anything bad. God, I hope not. When Bojack is taking Penny to prom, you get worried, but then they kind of just have casual fun and it doesn't seem all that concerning. You start to lower your guard a bit. Then Bojack tells Penny that she looks just like her mother and all the alarm bells in your brain go off. Oh no. Then Penny's friend is dying of alcohol poisoning and the real alarm bells go off. <gasps> yeah, that was a pretty bad situation, but it seems to be well resolved. I don't think this incident will cause any problems at all in the future. None whatsoever. But back to the real story, Bojack takes Penny home and Penny, for lack of better words, comes on to him. This is the real make or break moment for Bojack's character. We want to believe that he won't have sex with a minor, with his old friend's daughter no less. And he doesn't. He does the responsible thing and tells Penny that she's too young to understand what she really wants. And so he leaves. He did the right thing. It almost seems too good to be true. Bojack then goes to the patio and reminisces about the past with Charlotte, who is sitting by the fire. This is where we are shown there is still a connection between Bojack and one of his old friends. Hey, haven't seen this before. Oh god, oh fuck. Mm. Oh, Bojack. Um, I, I think you got the wrong idea. Let's go. Let's get out of here right now. No, Bojack. It's so disappointing to see him push too hard to get together with Charlotte romantically, since she has a family, and they already had a great thing going with him staying with the family and being happy. He just had to keep pushing until things went wrong, just like he did with Herb. Or at least this can't get any word. <laughs> No. And just like before of Herb, this is the final nail in the coffin as Bojack's relationship with Charlotte is throttled. And we get the second F-bomb of the show, leading into a travel montage of Bojack heading back to LA while the theme plays. The Penny situation is one of the biggest moments in this series, so the theme playing here feels like a deliberate choice. Bojack returning to LA as the song plays shows how, despite his best efforts, Escape from L.A. is futile, as it's a part of him. L.A. itself isn't the tar pit. He is. It will always follow him wherever he goes, like the theme so closely associated with him. Also, the montage is cool to look at. I like pretty sunsets. Escape from L.A. is kind of a perfect episode of television. It's a truly heartbreaking look at how Bojack can't run from who he's become, or try and cling to an idealized version of what he wishes his life could have been. In the end, he can't escape and he has to return back to his miserable life. The same miserable life we see during the theme song of every episode now accompanies his return to LA. It's truly poetic stuff, and it all culminates with Bojack after two months away, seeing that Diane is still trying to escape her own life. Season two has a very unique theme present throughout all of its episodes. Exclusively in this season, we constantly hear variations of the line, what are you doing here? It's the line Bojack can't get right in the first episode of the season, and from there, it pops up at least once per episode for the remainder of the season. It takes on a variety of contexts and meanings, and Bojack frequently asks it to himself. It's a subtle way of implying that Bojack isn't happy with the life he chose, and that he desperately wants this perfect life with Charlotte that he hallucinated during Downer Ending. What is he doing wallowing away in a miserable place like LA? What is he doing here. At least the season finale ends things more optimistically. Diane finally gets her shit together and starts working again, encountering Mr. Peanut Butter at a restaurant. Instead of him getting angry that she's suddenly back without telling him, he's simply overjoyed to see her again and doesn't probe into the reason why she suddenly came back. 
I think that's a testament to his good nature and willingness to see the best in people. Bojack's story in this episode ends with him attending the screening of Secretariat, where he sees the CG double performing the role for him. A thing that is purely cartoon logic and not at all something that can happen in real life. And once more asks for the final time, what he's doing here before running off to save Todd. Bojack finally realizes that his relationship with Todd is incredibly important to him. One of the few positive relationships in his life that he hasn't completely ruined yet. So he saves Todd from the Scientologists. I mean the improv club. Silly me. How'd I get those things confused? It's a triumphant moment for Bojack's character since he's finally going out of his way to do something nice for Todd. And an indication that maybe he'll start becoming a better person from here on out. So then he goes jogging exactly where he was when the season began. This is poetic for two reasons. One, the obvious. He is given the advice by the kind monkey man, it gets easier, but you have to do it every day. Like we established earlier, you have to work to make that change. It doesn't just happen. But once it starts, every day more progress is made and faster and easier. But then there's the second. During the filming of Secretariat, Bojack repeats to himself, I'm tired of running in circles, showing that he keeps making the same mistakes every time and he ends up right where he started, literally running or jogging in circles. Yeah, so take whichever interpretations you like and run with it. Or both, I don't know, it's free meal Monday, go nuts. One can only hope that it really does get better and easier for Bojack from here on out. Maybe by the end of season three, he'll be in a better place where he can definitively say that it's gotten better and easier. Only time will tell. So that closes out season two, and- Oh shit, we completely forgot about the part where Princess Carolyn dates Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh yeah, okay, Rutabaga, he's fine, and PC started her own agency, good for her. But it does lead the way for one of the best characters in the show to make his grand appearance next season. Hoo boy, I'm excited. But yeah, season two is absolutely phenomenal. It builds on the foundation laid out by season one so beautifully, and expands the characters and their relationships with each other to an insane degree. The main plot, where both Jack slowly becomes disillusioned with his dream movie and LA in general is exceptionally strong, and the relationship between Diane and Mr. Peanut Butter gets surprisingly dramatic and compelling. Todd's shenanigans are at their best during many of this season's episodes, PC does some stuff also, and everything culminates with a fantastic episode 11 and a great breather afterwards to cap off the season. This is undoubtedly one of my favorite seasons of television ever. Season 2 of Bojack is the season that made me fall in love with the show. I liked season 1, but felt that the show didn't truly start until episode 6. But season 2 from start to finish is a masterpiece of a season and some of the best entertainment has to offer. It was with this season I realized just how special this show was, and it did not disappoint from there on after. After season 2, I could safely say this is my favorite TV show of all time. And it's got some pretty stiff competition, like there's the one with the wombat, and the one with the skeleton, the one with the ghost, <laughs> St stiff competition, they're stiffs, death joke! So anyway, that's about it. Now it's time to talk about season three. Oh my god, where did the time go? Yeah, you're telling me I'm the one that has to edit all this. I help too! Yeah, let's take a nap right now. After we wake up from our coma in 30 years, then we can discuss seasons three and four in part two. Please up! Three. It'll be a toddly good time. You don't pay me enough for this, you know that, right? Thanks for watching. Bye. Like, comment, subscribe. And now it is sponsor time. Do you want to develop skills like the ability to make movies so you can fill in for the original director of a project after she gets fired for breaking into the Nixon library and filming a shot there? Well then, boy, do I have a service for you. Skillshare, an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. You can explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. This is a site that legitimately makes learning new skills fun and easy, since the lessons are broken up into short chunks that you can watch at your own pace. It's so engaging as a result. Right now, I'm really enjoying Penny Lane's class, Filmmaking from Home, Turn Found Footage into a Compelling Video. It's a great class with a lot of valuable information on how to create engaging videos without having to film anything. Perfect for anyone who loves editing and wants to get better at it, but doesn't really like filming. 
like me. Why else do you think I talk to y'all as a Tomatoa PNG all the time? Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes, so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. Plus, because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Free! Just click that link and enjoy all the knowledge Skillshare has to offer today. No. Mom! Charlotte. Penny? Duncan!